Uh, good morning. My name is Amar Jyot Singh, and today is uh, July 1st, Canada Day. Uh, best wishes to everybody who are celebrating Canada Day, even if you are at home. Uh, and uh, I'm looking to talk to a, a distinguished lawyer in Montreal. And as usual, I always talk immigration law. If you are coming to Canada for the first time, you can be rest assured that you will be examined at the border. Uh, the immigration will ask you several questions, including inspecting your luggage, checking your passport, documents, checking your visa, and find out how you got the visa, what is your purpose of travel, who will you meet, how much funds you have. And if this is your um, not the first visit, then they will also likely check your previous immigration history to Canada to find out what happened in the past. Uh, several times uh, things go wrong at the airport and uh, travelers, especially the first time travelers, uh, feel that they were uh, given wrong questioning or they were asked those questions too harshly and sometimes, uh, you know, very aggressively. Uh, in, in cases where the officer is not satisfied with your purpose, with your behavior, with your questions, uh, sometimes they take, uh, you know, even uh, harsher action, for example, sending you back to your country of origin. So we have a case uh, and they, they, we will discuss this case today uh, with the lawyer. Uh, what happened in this case was that the person had to go back and then they decided to fight this uh, refusal in a court in Canada. Uh, many people ask me what options do we have uh, if they are if they have been uh, wronged by the decisions by the immigration or the border uh, you know bso uh, what can they do of course the you know if there's any merit in the case you can take it to the federal court and to go to the federal court you need a lawyer who can represent you it's uh, close to a one hour meeting there and the federal court judge will decide whether there's uh, any breach of uh, you know, procedural, uh, you know, uh, for example, fairness or some other issue that they see, and then they can uh, order that decision to be redecided and sent to a different officer. That's how it works. So, uh, with this little intro, I will welcome uh, Annabelle uh, from Montreal. Annabelle, how Hi. are you? I'm well, thank you, Amarjot. I'm well, thank you. Happy Canada Day to you. Thank you. Thank you to you as well. Annabelle, I read about you and I was. Uh, uh, struck by your uh, glowing resume on your website that you fight for your clients and the way you dealt this case it is quite remarkable i've been reading immigration cases for a long time and i always seek out uh, diamonds in the rough and i think you are one. Oh, thank you uh, so uh, for viewers let me just show you the the case and if somebody wants to read more about the case they can go to canley or they can go to the federal court website to search the case and let me just show you the name of the case just in case and uh, if you want to do some more research uh, then you can uh, annabelle can you see the yes court thing so the docket number on was on the right citation number as well fc 559 and uh, you know, everything is right there and the name of the client and uh, is right right here. So just to give you a brief intro on what really happened, uh, I'll just go to something which I have highlighted in advance. Uh, I'm reading number three. Annabelle, can you see this? Yes. Yeah, so in this case, the applicant applied to enter Canada to visit his Canadian brother for a period of one month. According to the applicant, he was questioned, intimidated, and insulted by the Canadian immigration officer during the process of entering Canada. The same officer allegedly confiscated his personal belongings and forcibly boarded him on a return flight. So this is the this is the crux of what was happening. And, and I will ask Annabelle, what did the client tell you when uh, he sought your help? Is this what he told you? Uh this is what he told us, um, and interestingly, we didn't have any documents from him to show us what happened procedurally, because all we heard was that he came to Canada, uh, tried to uh, cross the border, and the uh, border officer, you know, obviously got uh, quite upset with him. You know, brought him to a separate area. And he's, he told us that the border officer tried to force him to sign something, but we weren't sure exactly what it was. 
And then he told us that he was forced to get on the plane back home, even though he insisted to the officer, you know, my brother's waiting for me on the other side of this gate. So please call him and you'll have all the answers to your questions. But for a reason that we don't understand, because unfortunately uh, we don't have the officer side of the story because uh, he or she did not submit an affidavit to the federal court like they, they could have. Uh, so we don't have their side of the story, but uh, our client was put on a plane, the, the same plane that he came to Canada on, and then we heard from him soon thereafter. Yeah. Uh, would you know, would you remember that this was uh, not his first visit? He was here earlier, so he has right. some history of immigration. What What was his uh, general uh, compliance to immigration uh, earlier, the last visit, the first visit, did he uh, leave Canada in time or was there some problem? He did. There? He did leave Canada in time, but his first visit was an indication of how his second arrival in Canada was going to go. Okay. Because the first time he came to Canada with a multiple entry visitor visa that was valid for many, many years, he arrived and he already had trouble at the border. They in, they interrogated him, they asked him many questions, and that time uh, his brother was also waiting for him. They did call his brother and to verify the facts that he was alleging. Because although I see, completely see the side of the story that my client is telling, I understand that CBSA, they see the worst of the cases. So yeah. they see people who are claiming to be visitors, but actually enter Canada and maybe work without a work permit and do all kinds of other things and disappear into um, the forest. So they do see the worst case scenarios and that's why they are careful about who they let in and who they uh, ask to go home. That being said, their decision needs to be based on some kind of evidence and they need to follow certain procedures. So our client, because he was given a difficult uh, time the first time he was let into Canada, but he was allowed in on the condition that he left by March 2018 and he arrived in January 2018. He left by that date, yeah. um, but then attempted to re-enter Canada the same year, eight months later. And I think what he didn't realize in this in uh, in this case, and what many people may not realize, is that some individuals are flagged in the system. Yeah. So as soon as he uh, had his passport scanned by the border officer, the border officer com could immediately see this is someone who is potentially going to cause trouble, maybe, and we need to look into this further. So it wasn't just, he wasn't just a kind of a visitor with a blank slate. He had a history. His history was conforming with the laws of Canada, but in the eyes of a border officer, he was someone worth taking a bit more time to uh, question. Yeah, without, without uh, uh, being sounded prejudiced, uh, it, is, it is quite, uh... Uh, you know, common to expect that, you know, I think the, the typical border officer, typical, not all, would likely uh, see somebody coming from a less developed country uh, with uh, somebody who has uh, less income, uh, does not have uh, enough extensive world travel, uh, coming with uh, less funds in the pocket and maybe mm -hmm. with, a, with, a, with a purpose that does not fit in the definition of a typical tourist and that person will likely be flagged as whether really he's a tourist or he has some other so the intent i'm reading on the gcms notes uh, what the officer uh, has written as as in your case uh, he did not have any hotel reservation uh, he bought his ticket two days ago in cash uh, he did not know where he was uh, going for a tourist purpose, what did he want to see, or where did he uh, uh, wanted to go and visit some country, countries? He had a salary of five hundred dollars, so I can ignore that. Maybe you know that's not quite. The subject's luggage is not representative of the duration of the trip. Was he carrying too much luggage, or not looking like a tourist, or what was he carrying? 
So when I read these GCMS notes, I found them hard to understand based on the facts that my client was telling me, but also based on the facts that I saw in his visitor visa application. Um, he was carrying a backpack and a suitcase, so he uh, didn't understand at all why that was suspicious. Yeah. And that's something we raised on the reasonability um, aspect of the decision. Also, not having a hotel reservation is consistent with the fact that his brother has a residence in Montreal and that he was coming to visit his brother. So that's not at all suspicious. I also found that they, they um, misconstrued the evidence because while he does have a salary of 500 Canadian dollars, he has a lot of added financial uh, benefits in his job. So while his salary may be, his base salary is $500, he earns more money than that per month. Um, so I found that they, they didn't present the fact, the officer didn't present the facts the way that my client presented them to me and the way that I saw them from the visitor visa application. Yeah. Uh, what, what, uh, what might have been asked uh, to this applicant uh, in, in terms of exploring his uh, non-immigrant intent? Uh, does he really, did he have any other application or any other indication that, you know, maybe he wanted to leave his job and come here, he was seeking to find a job in this trip or the earlier trip, or maybe he had made an express entry entry profile or something. What might have triggered the fact that he is not a genuine uh, visitor? Uh, we have no evidence on the record that would explain why they would have suspected him other than the fact that in the CBSA's eyes, this person doesn't earn a lot of money, even though in his own country, his salary is qu quite good. Um, he had made two trips within the same year, and the CBSA found that strange. <laughs> also, the fact that he purchased his flight in cash, which for a Canadian may seem strange, but in many countries in the world, cash transactions are more common than credit card transactions because not everybody has that uh, structure yeah. that's there. Yeah. Um, so that is a kind of, it's an example of how viewing things through a Canadian lens, things can seem suspicious. Um, also, the fact that he, he purchased his flight a couple of days before flying to Canada, but his brother, as we see from the record, he works in Fort McMurray. It's altogether plausible that he had vacation coming up, told his brother, hey, yeah. I'm going to be back in Montreal for this amount of time. Why don't you come visit me? Oh, it happens. The brother can take vacation. And so he... Um, he came to Canada, so I think there there are facts that can be viewed suspiciously if one adopts that perspective. But then there are other facts where it's just the reality of the situation in Algeria. You maybe don't plan things so far in advance, and you do buy uh, expensive plane tickets in cash. Yeah, when I when I advise people, and if they ask me uh, suggestions or advice about. Uh, how to get a tourist visa, visitor visa, and then uh, enter Canada. I always tell people, uh, whatever you filled in your tourist visitor visa applications. So when you fill a visitor visa application, you might have attached some documents, your job letter, your proof of income, your bank statement, your funds, invitation, who's inviting you, blah, blah, and all those things. I always tell people, when you come to Canada, when you are entering the, the airport, all those documents that were presented at the time of the Vista visa, you must have a photocopy of all the documents. Mm -hmm. So that means in this case, I would have expected things would have been smoother if he Much. carried if he carried his job letter wherever he was working, if he had his job letter, if he had his bank statement for at least about a few months, let's say six months, consecutive mm -hmm. months to show what has been his average balance, maybe equivalence in Canadian dollars. Uh, if he was, uh, you know, going to uh, stay in a hotel, maybe hotel confirmation receipt, or if he was flying to Fort Mac, you know, the onwards trip to Fort Mac from, from Montreal, uh, his, uh, his brother's invitation letter, you know, something mm -hmm. to show that his brother really is, uh, you know, uh, you know in, has invited him, maybe his brother's PR card or citizen card or something. 
those documents would have calmed the 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 concerns of the of the examination officer at the airport a, a little bit at least uh, you know and then they could have advanced their questions uh, but Thank that's you. that's that's why it does i think many people do not uh, we, we can't expect everybody to know all this and um, uh, so this happens so uh, what was your uh, strategy in when you were thinking to approaches to the to the uh, federal court what were you thinking what were your main planks of attack to to conquer this well at at the very beginning because we didn't have enough information we were shooting in the dark um, but luckily when you submit your initial proceeding at the federal court that to indicate that you were asking for permission um, and to apply for judicial review that triggers the federal court requesting from the decision maker the detailed reasons for the refusal decision. Correct. So we knew by filing that initial proceeding at the federal court that we could get more information and then refine our strategy going forward. And that's what we did. And in this case, unusually, it took a very long time to get the detailed reasons for the refusal. We initially only received a copy of the um, voluntary withdrawal of yeah. your request to enter Canada form, which is a form that sometimes visitors who don't meet uh, the expectations of the border officer, are they're given the opportunity to withdraw their request to enter Canada and they can sign this form and go back to wherever they came from without a giant X being written um, next to their name. <laughs> and so this, my client refused to sign this form because he was so adamant in the fact that he was a genuine visitor and he wanted someone to investigate further instead of just put him back on the plane. So on this form we received in writing, it says in French, refused to sign over his signature. And we see the border uh, officer signature, but we don't have his or her name. So that's all we received. And then I wrote again to the federal court and said, but we don't have the detailed reasons. We still don't know why he was put back on the plane. And so again, they requested uh, the detailed reasons. And then many months later, we got the paragraph of GCM notes that you saw in the decision. And uh, that further informed our arguments. Uh, for, for the benefit of people who are now traveling to Canada or will travel in the future, uh, j just, a, just a general question. Uh, can people who face some kind of uh, coercion or intimidation to sign here and then this is the decision is forced on them can they can they ask for a lawyer at the airport right away while everything is happening at the border or they don't have a right to a counsel uh, at, the, so at that point there's a bit of a debate about that uh, when your right to have a lawyer kicks in it usually kicks in when you're detained yeah. against your will and there is some kind of accusation of something so in my experience i don't think they would have let him have a lawyer at that time okay. because they weren't formally accusing him of anything and they were detaining him but with for the purpose of sending him back yeah so there could be a debate about it um but I, I know that in interviews with IRCC, with border officers, lawyers are usually allowed to attend sometimes for the per, just to observe, but uh, I don't think he would have been allowed to have called a lawyer yeah. at that time. I've got it. Okay, and I'm showing on the screen, if you can see the screen, there are four issues identified by the judge. Number one was, was there a decision made against the application, uh, applicant that made a decision to send him back? Is this case moot? Uh, was the officer decision tainted by the breach of procedure fairness? And as usual, was it reasonable? So those were the four issues uh, raised. And uh, tell me which one of these four was your favorite when they this was identified, and what did you? How did you plan to to mount your response? 
Um, well, during the hearing, my favorite issue became, was there a decision or not? Because the uh, lawyer for the government of Canada pleaded that there had been no decision and that my client had voluntarily got on the plane to go home, oh, yeah. which from an outsider's perspective was very difficult to understand because even though there was no written decision in the sense that I am deporting you from Canada, there still was a decision made. And so it was very satisfying for me to have the judge agree on that point since yeah. you, you could, I suppose, argue that there wasn't a decision, but, but there was. Um, and there was a discussion after this uh, decision came out in the immigration uh, law community because this, this question, was there a decision, wasn't there a decision, it doesn't really matter because the federal court can still consider a judicial review of many things that aren't decisions, of orders, of, yeah. of everything that is listed in uh, paragraph 72 of the Immigration Refugee Protection Act. And so uh, it says even says determination and so it didn't really matter if there had been or not a decision, but I, I did appreciate it when the judge uh, wrote in his judgment, uh, you know, I completely disagree with um, Justice's argument. What, what about uh, procedural fairness? Uh, uh, was the, obviously the applicant was not given any chance to, uh, to clarify or respond how he was eligible to uh, to uh, to uh, enter uh, mm -hmm. the the judge mentioned and uh, I'll show you on the screen if I can let me see if I can show you um, here uh, so I'm reading para 81 mm -hmm. in this case the officer skirted the process of withdrawing the application in order to obscure a decision of inadmissibility to make a removal order that was in fact made unilaterally by the officer. He did not even prepare the report for section 44 because mm -hmm. this report would have, uh, I'm reading 82, uh, this deprives the applicant of the right of review by the minister's delegate. What do you think of mm -hmm. this observation? That is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, a weakness in the case by the government uh, against your client. Definitely, definitely. And I think this paragraph is very helpful because when we were preparing for the hearing for this case and were obviously reading other decisions rendered by the federal court, we couldn't find one exactly like this. And so in rendering this decision, this judge is clarifying, yeah. it wasn't clear before, that officers can't do this. First of all, they can't claim that someone has voluntarily withdrawn their request to enter Canada when the, the claimant request is not voluntary. So that's the first point. You can't force someone to sign a form. Yeah. And the second point is if the visa officer genuinely, you know, he had or he or she had concerns and wanted to proceed to the next step, they would have written a Section 44 report, which is basically a document that says, I think this person is inimitable to Canada because, for example, I suspect that they will work illegally. And they usually cite a provision of the law that they believe the person is violating. And then that report goes to somebody else, the minister's delegate, who is another administrator who reviews that report and decides, okay, is there a credible basis for these concerns? If so, should I refer this case to a tr tribunal, the immigration division, yeah. where a judge or the board member of the tribunal will decide, yes, this person is inadmissible or no, this person is not inadmissible. And so that's the normal course of of how this would have gone had the officer followed the procedure. Yeah, uh, the the major takeaway from this discussion is for people to understand uh, whether they are foreign nationals entering at the border or foreign nationals already in Canada. Uh, 
uh, waiting for some outcome on the immigration application within Canada, like a spousal or express entry mm -hmm. or uh, any other uh, maybe uh, immigration IAD appeal or anything. Uh, that breach of procedural fairness is a major plank of judicial review. If your rights uh, have been constrained, uh, that means you were not given adequate chance or opportunity to explain your facts so that you know the system does not recognize that you uh, that you were not given an opportunity to explain. Uh, this is this is a major factor of, of approval of JR as far as I know. Would you agree? I would definitely agree and I would recommend that anybody who has received a refusal decision for whatever application, be it visitor visa or study permit or sponsorship application, any type of refusal, the first step to, to take is to request the GCMS notes, which you can do via an access to information request. Yeah. This should come within 30 days. And if your refusal is from an embassy that's outside of Canada, you know that you have 60 days to contest it at the federal court. And what you want to do is understand why your application was refused. Take those reasons to a lawyer who can then judge whether or not it's worth applying for judicial review at the federal court. And this is important because let's say you get your visitor visa refusal and you just decide to apply again in two months because you think that maybe the officer was in a bad mood that day and you have better chances a second time one of the first thing the officer sees is that you were refused in the past and it will play against your chances of being accepted in the future unfortunately your applications are not considered as independently of each other as you might hope so it's important that if you do get a refusal to really examine thoroughly whether or not you can contest at the federal court. And that's what, what uh, how important your point is about procedural fairness, because a lawyer can tell by reviewing the detailed reasons if there is only a question of reasonability on the table or did they make a credibility judgment without consulting the applicant? Did they unreasonably or unfairly hold a previous refusal against you without giving you the chance to answer to it? So I think your point is essential um, to to just always examine your chance of judicial review and procedural fairness is definitely uh, something that increases your chance of success. Great. Uh, before I uh, before I uh, digress to a, a different point here, let me show you on the screen the magic words uh, first uh, the name of the lawyer who represented annabelle uh, right here and also let's look at the uh, this is the name of the people everything the date of hearing and the judge name everything right there and uh, the magic sentence which i wanted to people to show on 87 for these reasons the application for jr is allowed this is the sweetest statement that the applicant wants to hear and what happened after the JR was allowed what what happened to the client and was he uh, where is the client right now first of all so the client right now is in Algeria okay um, and your question is a good one because this case was unusual in that when your your visa uh, visitor visa is refused and you contest at the federal court and you win your file goes back to a different decision maker who can then review it and render a new decision. Whereas in this case, that's not what we are asking for because he's not trying to enter Canada again at the moment. So it's not a decision that can be reviewed by a new officer. So we asked ourselves, well, what, yeah, what are we asking for? And we were asking for two things. One, uh, costs. Yeah. which is very rare in immigration uh, judicial review decisions, it's when you basically ask the losing party to pay the applicant a sum of money because their behavior was so abhorrent that the applicant deserves more than just their application being allowed. And so we weren't sure if we were going to get any costs awarded, but the judge did award a $500 to the applicant. 
Yeah. We would have rather it reimbursed his whole flight, which was eight hundred dollars, and that was in the record. But we will be grateful for what the applicant was given, and uh, we did receive a check from the uh, Justice Department, and we forwarded it to our client. So at least he has five hundred dollars, although that doesn't save him from the money that he paid us, right, to contest his uh, decision. So I do um, recognize and I think everybody owes a huge credit to this applicant who financed this case for a principal. You know, he was treated unfairly and he was going to show the visa or the border officer that this was not correct. And uh, even though he risked losing all his money that he paid, um, he did it, so I was really impressed with that. The other thing that we asked for was for the um, judge to order that in the GCMS notes, which are visible to any immigration officer around the world, yeah. for there to be a huge note saying that decision above that was rendered in November 2018, removing the applicant from Canada was illegal, null and void as uh, is written in the judgment and uh, judicial review was sought and um, allowed. So the, 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 the lawyer for Justice Canada made it clear that they can't erase anything in the GCMS notes. They couldn't remove the, the entry that he was removed. So all we can do to remedy the situation is add to the notes and make it clear for that next border officer who reviews our client's uh, file yeah. that uh, they best be careful and not render um, an illegal decision. Is the, is the client looking to, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure he must be ecstatic, is the client looking to uh, enter Canada in the future near future or what is his future immigration uh, what is his future canada plans uh he hasn't shared any uh concrete plans with us uh, but since his brother is in montreal and looks like he will be for the foreseeable future and our client's visitor visa is valid until 2025 it's likely that he will want to return although given the way he was treated i'm not sure um how he feels about returning to montreal at this yeah. point but but hopefully in the future, uh, he will feel welcome to come back. Yeah. Uh, 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 friends, you know, this is a, this is a great discussion uh, with an outstanding lawyer who who fought on the right plank of, of, of the rule of law uh, to defend the rights of foreign nationals who already have obtained a visa. They already satisfied the visa officer in that country mm -hmm. to get a visa and upon entry uh, at the CPS, they can use their own discretion. But in this case, uh, the federal court sided against uh, with the client and against the CPS say that I think that person uh, was justified an entry. Uh, the lawyer, uh, first, uh, first of all, if uh, you know, if you have any, uh, if you have any concern or anything problem in your own immigration file, for example, your study visa was refused or visitor visa or PR application, family sponsorship, or anything. I know in family sponsorship, you know, you got to go to IAD appeal, of course, uh, that mm -hmm. takes a long time. It's it's not like a JR. Uh, it's a full one day appeal, one day hearing. Uh, for anything, you should contact the lawyer. I'm going to share her uh, information on the screen. Uh, if you can, can you see the, Annabelle, your own website? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Annabelle. Uh, the phone, the email address is listed here. I think I'm going to just highlight it. Maybe I just make it a little bigger. I don't know if it's clearly, yeah. Uh, her email address and her direct phone number is everything is listed and she is based in Montreal and she can be contacted separately, directly, independently for any uh, possible appeal, whether it's JR or a regular appeal to Immigration uh, Refugee Board including refugee matters as well. I have uh, uh, one uh, separate question uh, to you, Annabelle, about something related to your area of practice. Um, I do a lot of spouse work permit. Spouse work permit, just to remind, uh, uh, refresh your, your understanding of spouse work permit to people who do not know. Students who are full-time students in Canada, they have a right 
to invite their spouses uh, under under code, uh, which is LMI exam code C42, uh, and they can bring them, you know, here they can, they, they, these spouses come on an open work permit, uh, but routinely because of the uh, uh, concerns about bona fides of marriage, which is regulation four, the visa officers in the past, in the close to about six months, I think since last year, since the uh, the new Trudeau government came in, I think starting from October or November last year, uh, the visa officers have been overzealous in uh, in um, implementing the requirements of R4, which normally goes for sponsorship for PR, not for temporary TRV. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, they are they are aggressively checking the bona fides and genuineness of the marriage to decide whether this person is a spouse in that definition to come to here. Mm -hmm. uh, many times these people will be interviewed at the visa offices outside, and in this interview they will be interviewed just like, and the interview is is to the level and depth of a interview for PR spouse. So that means they will be asked. Uh, and check for photographs and honeymoons and cohabitation and you know uh, you know relationship history and 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 the long thing. What I was alarmed at, uh, and that's the reason I'm, I'm raising this with you, was that in some cases the visa officers, uh, uh, you know, uh, they they refused the application because the applicant could not uh, go to the level of of the depth of memory that is expected of mm. them as you would do in Canada. For example, uh, you know, uh, they were asked, you know, uh, what was the date that you went there to meet your fiance? And mm. perhaps he forgot, perhaps he did not remember that was some years ago or whatever. Mm. By just not remembering just a bit of memory and th they were decided that your application does not meet the requirement and that's it, bye bye. And on top of that, they were they were charged under Section 40 for misrepresentation for five years, and that is what that is what it started the movement. And I have I have so many people who are uh, now you know suffering because of Section uh, 40 and five years because of not being able to satisfy the R4 bona fides requirement. They were charged for misrepresentation. So now my question to you is this: somebody. Somebody who who does not uh, satisfy the bona fides, I can understand. Maybe they are not; uh, uh, they have not combined their affairs into as as you would expect. But they can be; they can be, and they they possibly should be refused for for a, a spouse work permit. But going to the length of charging for misrepresentation and saying that you do not meet the definition of spouse, I think that is. Uh, that should be challenged, and that is challengeable, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, on the on the arbitrary nature of of imposing section 40 on refusal of genuineness of uh, of spouse relation. What mm -hmm. do you what do you think? Um, so it's hard for me to comment generally on a, a pattern that I haven't witnessed myself, and because I don't see a lot of um, exactly the type of case that you're talking about. Um, I do see a lot of other kinds of Section 40 um, inadmissibility cases, and I think, in general, there seems to have been um, have have been an increase in Section 40 allegations against applicants, which obviously carry very severe consequences. So I would advise people two things. First of all, if you know you're going to be subject to that kind of an interview, whether it's a sponsorship interview at an overseas embassy or a border officer is going to interview upon going to Canada, I would consult somebody before you get to Canada, a lawyer who can prepare you for that interview. No. We do that all the time with clients that aren't ours, that we have not handled their applications, but they just want to be prepared for the interview when they arrive. So that's one thing we can do. And because we've seen a lot of refusals, we know how to spot um, problems. And often when you're nervous, you obviously don't answer questions as well as when you're not. And um, decision makers will pick up on all kinds of things 
to um, doubt your credibility. You know, yeah. if you hesitate before you answer, if you don't understand the question, but you didn't express that, and instead you answer a completely different question, they'll think you're trying to avoid their question. Yeah. And then, um, you know, be suspicious of you. So that'd be one thing. The second thing is if this happens to you and you get a, a Section 40 allegation and you're uh, deemed inadmissible or decided that you're inadmissible, then I would do, as I said before, and get the detailed notes from the visa officer or the border officer. Ask a lawyer, do you think I have grounds for judicial review here? And if you do, go for it because uh, the consequences are severe. Yeah, yeah. No. That's, that's great. Uh, so thank you very much, Annabel, for your time. I know uh, you have some cases to read or study and present your submissions for some future um, you know, litigation. Um, today is Canada Day. I'm glad that you made time to talk to me. And in the future, okay. I will discuss uh, more cases with you, especially, okay. especially judicial review cases. And meanwhile, uh, friends, if you have any um, if you have any direct inquiry for her, I will post her full contact information at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then you can send her email directly and consult her for possible JR in your own case. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Amarjo. Bye. Goodbye.